So I'm going to talk to you tonight about uh, nine ways to manipulate people with design. I feel compelled at the beginning of this to point out, not like sinisterly manipulate people, just nicely manipulate people in like a good way, in a way that helps them do things and stuff. It's not entirely sinister, it's just a little bit sinister. Um, but yeah, we'll talk about nine ways to manipulate people with design, uh, and at the end of this, uh, hopefully you'll have some, some new tools in your tool chest for getting what you want, or what your users want, or your customers want. So, designing products is about designing experiences. Designing products is not pixels, and it's not wireframes, and it's not just sketches. It's really designing an experience that people are really going to stick with, that they're going to enjoy, and that they're going to remember, and that you are going to be happy that you gave them. If you consider designing products like chairs, Chairs are very functional. There's some chairs up here on stage which are kind of cool looking and I don't know how comfortable they are. Um, but you're all sitting in, in some cases, very nice chairs and in some cases, less nice chairs and in some cases, those like stools up in the back that look really awkward. Um, but you think about like designing chairs, they're very utilitarian. It's very like, you need to have a surface on which your butt can rest. You need to have like a back in most cases so that you can lean back and not fall over. They're very utilitarian kinds of things. But if you really design a, a, a product right, if you really design something something well, all the best products create lasting connections, like chairs. Chairs that have like really lasting connections, you know? Like these particular chairs, which are actually now in the National Museum of American History. Like these are chairs that not only did the characters who sat in them have an attachment to, but the rest of the country did as well. Um, and they're not special chairs. They're in some cases kind of shabby looking pieces of crap. Um, but really, really well designed products and hey, how's it going? <laughs> <laughs> oh, cool. This way I can pace more easily because I like to pace. Um, but we develop these really irrational, to some extent, irrational attachments to products. Uh, we develop these kind of like, in some cases, sort of obsessive attachments to products, right? And you can design for that. You can design for connection. You can design for attachment. You can design for obsession in a way. A perfect example of that is people's phones. When people are checking their phones, when you're kind of looking around and people are just fiddling with their phones, the overwhelming likelihood is that they're on Facebook. People check Facebook over 14 times a day on average. That's more than Twitter, that's more than email, that's more than most anything else that people do on their smartphones, is they check Facebook. What was that? Well, okay, yeah, you, you could make an argument for like Angry Birds or something. But, um, but Facebook is like the lasting one, you know? You get tired of Angry Birds space and you, well, I did anyways. Um, and you come back to, everybody comes back to Facebook. So if you see someone checking their phone, it's probably Facebook. And Facebook was really well designed for connection. It was really well designed for emotional attachment. And they tug on your little, your little strings really, really well, um, as you, most of you probably know. I know there's some people who are really still resistant to Facebook for a number of different reasons and more power to you, but you're all alone. Um, <laughs> At the end of the day, we are vain, cheap, and easily amused people. And I don't mean that in a bad way. It sound <laughs> okay, I mean it in a little bit of a bad way, um, but not a terribly bad way. We are kind of vain. We are kind of like cheap and easily amused. Like we, we latch on to things. We latch on to trivial things. We latch on to kind of silly things, and we latch on to really basic instincts, not the naughty kind. Um, no basic instinct? Nothing? All right, fine. Um, but we do latch onto these, like, these little silly things that kind of like tug on us and get us in just the right part of our head uh, so that we just keep coming back to something. We keep coming back to a product or we keep coming back to something that was designed. All of the best products like this were designed. There are very few lasting connections and lasting sort of services or products or, or objects or, or tools or toys or whatever uh, that really stick with people that weren't designed. Most everything is designed. So when I say we're vain and cheap and easily amused, I mean there's some obvious examples of things like us being cheap and easily amused, like TMZ. Um, but it's not all, you know, to be totally honest, I've never actually seen TMZ. It just seemed like kind of a cheap shot for, like, crap. Um, I assume that it's crap. Uh, but we are easily amused by some of these things. So let's talk about nine ways in which you can easily amuse vain, cheap people, right? <laughs> cool. Um, so nine ways, here we go. First off, familiarity bias. There is a reason wedding singers sing the same songs over and over and over and over again. Wedding singers are expected to have a very particular kind of repertoire, and that's because people are comfortable with things that they know. They're comfortable with things that they are familiar with, that are 
uh, just they're they're sort of part of their part of their core being. They're just things that you're really really used to. If somebody got up at a, you know if, if if Adam Sandler got up at a wedding or whatever and started singing like something by Tool, you know no one's gonna get up and dance. A couple you know a couple of you would. I know you would. Looking at you, bearded guy. Um, so some people would. But you know they they do sort of the same things and they have a very particular kind of thing that they're into. This familiarity bias is is really really prevalent. We are very comfortable with things that we know. We like what we know. Boy, that is like eye bleedy on the projector. All right, well, sorry. The best new things use familiar patterns. When you're gonna build something really, really new, not everything about it needs to be new for it to be something interesting, for it to be something memorable. Not everything about it has to be brand new. Sometimes that works really well. There's instances where new products come out and they do just everything in a really crazy way. And sometimes that's really cool, but most of the time it's not. Um, you're really used to, to familiar patterns and the best new things use those. For example, the iPhone. When the iPhone first came out, anybody in here know what skeuomorphism is? People familiar with that word, skeuomorphism? That's a lot of hands for skeuomorphism, that's cool. Um, when the iPhone first came out, it was an incredibly skeuomorphic device. And it was still an incredibly skeuomorphic device until like two months ago, a month ago. Um, and there was a reason for that. It wasn't just because Steve Jobs and Scott Forstall had some sort of hard-on for like fake leather or whatever. Can I say that? Is that a thing you can say? <laughs> whatever. Um, they kind of did, but it wasn't just because of that. It was because the idea of a phone like this, the idea of like a smartphone that was all touch, that had no physical keyboard, that was all tactile, that you had to pinch and zoom and whatever, people weren't going to understand how to use that if there had been no affordances, no pieces that people were familiar with. The calendar looked like a calendar. You know, when you like, when you sent an email, it was like it was like paper coming down, and you were like writing on paper, and it like slid away. It was things that you were reasonably familiar with, so that when you actually went to use it, it didn't feel totally alien. Like the phone thing felt like you were dialing like a you know like a touchstone kind of phone, and that was on purpose. Now we've moved well beyond that. We've gotten really used to the idea of touch devices, so everything in iOS 7 changed, and Windows went totally out to lunch. Uh, and did their thing, and Android has always been sort of in this vague, pseudo-designed kind of miasma, which they're finally getting out of. Um, but there was a good reason why it was so skeuomorphic for so long. Maybe too long, but there was a good reason for it. We're really used to familiar things. And familiar moments create trust. You know, if you use something and you recognize some of it, you recognize some of what's going on, you're gonna trust it a little bit more. Even if it's something brand new, even if it's something you've never used. And this can come out in like kind of interesting ways. Like you look, at, uh, you look at this, Squarespace, their website. This is about as skeuomorphic as it gets for a, for a website because this is literally just a photo of someone's desk. And this is like you're writing things on your desk. You're writing things in a journal. You have your cupcakes, evidently. You have your laptop. You have like a space that's very familiar. So when you, if you don't know what Squarespace is, if you've never been to Squarespace's website and you get to this page, you kind of go, oh, okay, create my own voice like I do from my laptop sitting at my desk with a notebook and a pen and my glasses and things I can draw and stuff that I'm really familiar with. So it creates trust. It kind of it helps you get over the hump of, I don't know what this thing is and I don't, I don't really believe it and I don't want to use it. It helps you get past that a little bit. And it makes it easy to get to know you. These are not at all even centered. I did not set this up right. Well, sorry. You're going to miss the left edge of my slides. It'll be OK. Um, <laughs> There's nothing important there. If there is, I'll let you know. Um, so it makes it easy to kind of get to know you. Like, th you know, things like this where it's like, uh, it's Spotify. When you're familiar with something like this, and there's a reason they use like this big kind of photography of everybody has their phone and everybody plugs in their headphones and everybody sits there and, I don't know that we all sit there and look ruggedly handsome on the side of the road and listen to music. <laughs> um, but we're all used to listening to music on our phones, that kind of thing. Like that's very familiar. That's a moment that we understand. And I can look at this and I can be like, okay, I could see myself in a similar sort of situation, just slightly you know, worse looking. Um, and I can understand, hey, I won't be charged until after my free trial ends and I can cancel any time. That puts me at ease. I, I, you know, I'm, I'm kind of used to this sort of thing. I'm used to that kind of language even. I'm very familiar with the kind of language, like I won't be charged for a 30-day free trial. Everyone understands a 30-day free trial. You don't see a lot of like 27-day free trials, right? That's not a thing that just happens very much. That's not just because it's hard to put on a calendar, it's also because people just aren't used to it. You don't really, you wouldn't trust it. 27 days, why is it 27 days? What happens in the last three days? Why is it 27, what happens? Is that to trick me? It's probably to trick me. 
It would be to trick you, actually. That would be sort of genius. You'd be waiting 30 days and you'd already be charged. I'm going to do that. Anyways, and design patterns that are familiar can make new interfaces feel familiar. So things like this, you know, over on the left-hand side, you can see uh, an example of just sort of like a, a, a UI kit uh, that's still very, has a lot of very really familiar affordances, right? It has like, you know, things look like buttons and you could clearly tap on them, that kind of stuff. And you've probably seen interfaces that use stuff a lot like this. You've probably seen them a whole lot of times. And on the right-hand side, you can see uh, some UI kits that, well, the one on the top certainly looks a little bit more modern, right? It looks a little bit newer. It looks a little bit shinier. It's actually, you're used to those kinds of things. You're familiar with how this kind of stuff works because you got used to the previous kind. You got used to the idea of a box with words in it is a button. It doesn't matter if it looks like a button. It doesn't matter if it's shiny like a button. A box with words in it is a button. Windows, uh, Windows 8, their Metro interface, actually suffers from this because they threw it out the window. They said a box with words in it could be a button, or it could be a box with words in it, or it could be something that you slide or swipe or, or scroll or pinch or what have you. They kind of abandoned some of that, and it wasn't familiar, and it wasn't expected, so it, it doesn't always work. Um, but you're used to how all these controls work because you're used to the affordances that we had for them before. Unfamiliar patterns, though, can create confusion at first. Uh, a really good example of this, anybody remember when uh, Twitter or Tweety for iOS came out, for the iPhone came out? Anybody actually remember back before Twitter bought them and then just sat on it for like a year and didn't do anything? Yeah. Um, it had this really cool feature at the time, which was you could pull it down to refresh. Like that was neat, right? Everybody who's like a big UI designer, like a big, uh, you know, big into interactions and stuff was like, oh, that's clever. And everyone else was like, why the hell when I pull this down is there a little arrow that keeps popping up and what is this doing? Like people were legitimately really confused by it. It was really strange when it first came out. Um, but it was unfamiliar at the time, but they kind of hammered on it and people got, got more used to it. And now it's like a built-in part of the operating system. It's a built-in part of a lot of operating systems to do this like pull to refresh that just became the new status quo. But it was hard work. It took like two years for that to become like really commonplace, something people were gonna understand. So this is not to say always do things that are familiar, you can do new things, but it's gonna be, an, it's gonna be a fight you know, to get, that, to get that to work. You can do it really well, and you can do it really cleverly, and this was really well done and really clever. Uh, Lauren Brichter did a good job on coming up with this particular interaction. Um, but it still took years for this to become normal. So just, you know, expect that. So familiarity is a big thing. If you, if you want to kind of tug on people in a, in a particular way, do things that they're familiar with. They're going to feel very comfortable. They're going to trust you a little bit more. They're going to give you more of their money. Yeah, more of their money. Um, so you can actually, you can rely on that. So let's talk about relative value. This is another one. This is another one that's easy to use and works remarkably well. Comparing is easier than appraising for almost everyone. It's much easier for you to figure out the value of something when you compare it to something else. In a vacuum, it's kind of hard. You know, if, if I just, you know, to be totally honest, if I came up to you and said, I have a gallon of milk and I will sell it to you for $4, I would have no idea whether that was a good deal or not. I don't know what milk costs. I buy it at the grocery store and it's part of my bill and I have no idea what it costs. If someone came up to me and said, here's a gallon of milk for $4 and here's a gallon of milk for $3 and they're exactly the same milk, I would buy the $3 milk because it's cheaper. I can compare things much more easily. Or if I looked at two gallons of milk and one was, you know, had chunks in it and one did not, like I, I can understand that. I can understand the difference. On its own, I may, not, I may not actually realize. Maybe milk is supposed to have chunks. I don't know. I pour it into cereal. I don't really notice what happens at the end. I actually do notice. I'm not that disgusting. Um, but comparing is much easier than appraising. It's why you see things like this so much. It's why very few services have one price point. Not just because not everybody fits one price point, like not everybody can, I mean, you look at this, it's like, okay, there's $8 a month, there's $16 a month, and there's $24 a month. In the grand scheme of things, this is not drastically different. This is like two lattes a month difference between each of these plans. We're not talking like hundreds of thousands of dollars. But you see plans like this very frequently because when people want to figure out what they're going to choose, they feel more comfortable about it if they can compare it to something else. People who choose the middle plan, which is by far the one that most commonly people pick, they like to be kind of middle of the road unless they have a really specific reason not to because nobody wants to be paying as much as they possibly can and nobody wants to be cheap. Um, but if they pick this middle plan here, then they can look at it and they can go, okay, it's $16 a month. Well, that's more than the standard one, but it's less than the business one, so I'm saving some money. It's totally arbitrary whether you're saving any money or not. Um, I'm saving some money, 
and I understand that the one in the middle has a bunch of unlimited things, and the one on the left does not have unlimited things, and the one on the right has some more unlimited things, but not things that I need, so cool, I'm good. So they'll pick the one, and they can, they can compare, and it's much, much simpler that way. Options make us feel in control. They make us feel like we are the masters of our own fate. You know, we're not being steamrolled into one particular thing. If you have to sign up for a service or you need a particular service and there's only one option, you might feel like, well, this isn't exactly what I wanted, but I didn't really have any choice, and that kind of sucks. So you're not going to feel good about it. Too many options can create uh, choice paralysis. It can paralyze people uh, if they have too many choices. This is an OK example. This is uh, like a you know, flight comparison kind of thing. The funny thing here is that actually there aren't that many options. There's only really five options on this page. But it can feel like a lot. There's other examples of things like this that are even worse for how many choices you can possibly make. But I mean, I've got all these filters over on the left. I don't know, I, do I want nonstop or not? Do I want to restrict my times? Do I care what cabin? It's like, oh god, and then there's details, and then there's a whole button for fares, and I'm just kind of like, oh, just, just tell me what I want. Like, um, anybody here actually use a Hipmunk? Hipmunk for flight stuff? Hipmunk's pretty cool. Hipmunk uh, tried to get around this. They do it OK. They tried to get around this by uh, basically telling you, we're going to show you a bunch of options, but the first one is going to be the least painful. So just pick that one. They don't actually really follow through on that and just say, here's the least painful one, do this. They just give you all of them, but they at least sort it out right. Um, travel stuff is, is terrible about this. They like to give you every option under the sun, whether you want it or not. Um, there's a lot of different services that just give you too many choices. It's important to give people a choice. It's important to give them some options. You want to be careful about how many you give them. It can be really distressing for people. Similar and in sort of the same vein as this, this is a fun one. Things that are limited have more value. <laughs> people feel like something is more valuable when there's less of it. It's, it's scarcity. People are really prone to uh, falling prey to scarcity. Um, so like shoes that I would look fabulous in, by the way. Um, all of these shoes. There's a couple here. There's like three on the screen. Um, this is from Gilt. Uh, there's three on the screen, and two of them say there's just one. There's just one left. There's only one pair of these shoes left. And one of them, there's only three left. I mean, th OK, there's still three left, so I don't have to like act now. Um, but the other two, there's, there's just one. Like, shit, if I want those, um, oh boy, Mallory Slingback. I don't even know what that means. Um, <laughs> if I want those, uh, I better do it right now. Like, that's, that's very valuable to me. Um, I mean, they're, you know, they're, they're cheap, like one's $89, $159, okay, I get that. They're cheap and they're on sale, but there's only one, so I have to do it right now. Funny thing is, uh, infomercials nailed this like 20 years ago. If you watch like late night TV, it's like, act now, this is an incredible deal, get all eight of these juicing tools for only $20, but it's only for the next hour. It's not for the next hour, it's for that hour and every other hour, it doesn't make any difference. Um, so they are manipulating you evilly. They are lying to you. I don't recommend that. I feel compelled to say that. Um, but they figured this out a long time ago. Scarcity makes people value things more. So if you can position a real scarcity, not a fake scarcity, uh, but if you can position like a real scarcity, people will respond to that pretty well. A fake scarcity, um, there's some good examples of, of faux scarcity that's not just infomercials. Uh, Digital publishers, especially like game companies, are incredibly guilty of this, or they were a couple of years ago. They'd be like, oh, you can buy the, the digital super advanced version of this game, but there's only 500 of them, so get it now. It's like, it's digital. There is an infinite number of them, obviously. <laughs> um, but people, people bought it, and they bought it, and they, they were one of the 500 people who got this special, super unique set of bytes that anybody could have had. Um, so it totally works. Just don't use it that way. So relative value, the ability to compare things and the ability to compare the scarcity of something, this can work really, really well. Give people options, explain what their options are, don't give them too many options. Uh, and if their options include things like less of one thing versus more of another thing, that actually can work for you and it actually can work for your customers. I mean, the funny thing about this is that whole like little just one label obviously is going to make people feel more interested or more compelled to buy something right now. But it's also, if they legitimately wanted those shoes, they really do have to do it right now because there's only one and someone else can buy them. So you're not necessarily, you're not duping people, you're not misleading people. You're helping them make a decision. 
All right, let's talk about bandwagons. I hate them. Is that, is that okay to say? I hate them. Um, bandwagon is the only way I can possibly explain that show. It can only be popular because it's already popular with other people. That's like a self-reinforcing loop, but I assume that's what happened. So bandwagon. We are easily swayed, or easily swayed by the behaviors and opinions of other people. We may think that we are, you know, a lone ship in a storm and we are carving our own fate entirely on our own, every man is an island kind of thing. We're not. We're very, very easily swayed by the opinions of other people. That's okay. Other people can, in aggregate, usually be trusted. Not always. Not when it comes to like voting elected officials or anything like that. We clearly can't trust that. Um, but you can be easily swayed by the opinions of other people. It's why you see things like this. Social proof. Keep up and meet your friends. See which of them are on Foursquare. Well, Spencer, Caleb, and 16 of my other friends are already using Foursquare, so obviously I should be using Foursquare. I like Spencer. I like Caleb. I should be doing what they're doing. That actually works. It works really, really super well. Social proof is like no joke. You see the, the little Facebook like buttons on everything under the sun these days? The, the little like button itself is entirely self-serving for, uh, for the site itself. When they show like which of your friends already liked it, that's, that's clearly meant for you. That's so that you'll understand that friends of yours have already vouched for something. There is a really, really, there's a strong strength in numbers. Things like trending, things that are trending, this is from Fab. Um, when you see stuff that's trending, it's like, okay, so these are things that's trending, that's fine, I may or may not buy that, but boy, 165 people thought that TV cabinet was pretty baller. I could use a TV cabinet and 165 total strangers can't be wrong, right? Of course they can, but you'll fall for it anyway. You'll do it anyways. And that's actually okay because legitimately 165 total strangers is actually a reasonable sample for something like that. It's actually a reasonable sample of what might be good or what might be interesting. Um, so the number of people who like a product, the number of people who also use a service, we're very, very susceptible to the, to the bandwagon approach. And bandwagon is, it works really well on us. If you're, uh, if, if you're a student of, I think it's, it's philosophy or psychology, I don't remember which one, maybe some of you are. Um, I think bandwagon is technically considered uh, a, a, a logical fallacy, like it's not actually true, um, but it works. <laughs> it's not actually true, but it works. Uh, you'll see things, Fab, you know, does more of this stuff. Today's best sellers, what's sold the best today? Well, whatever sold the best is probably pretty good. Um, so I'm going to latch on to things that sold really well. Their assumption is that things that sell well are going to sell well to other people, so they want to put it in front of you. But it works for you too. It works for customers or users or consumers or, uh, uh, or whatever, or what have you, clients, um, because they understand that today's best sellers work for them as well. And you know, stuff like this, like, uh, like on Foursquare, like, you know, find the perfect places to go with friends. And you can actually see in this case, it's not even some of it's aggregate because there's like 130 tips for one, there's 87 tips for another, there's 26 tips for another, but there's also just specific little quotes, you know. Jacqueline says the place where professional drinkers come to drink, which is cool and also a little dark. Um, although I can attest that place is actually really cool. Um, and you know, Richard says this is some great hiking and a great workout, which, you know, great workout doesn't appeal to me that much, but the great hiking could be fun and the trails are cool. Um, they're total strangers. I have no idea who Jacqueline is. I don't know who Richard is. I don't know who Antonio is. Um, but it's interesting and it, and it speaks to the fact that somebody else liked this thing, so I will probably like it as well. Bandwagon is, is super, super powerful, but it can also work against you. And this one's a little bit dangerous. People overwhelmingly put more importance on negative opinions than they do positive opinions. Like, overwhelmingly. Negative info, info is perceived as much more powerful than positive info. Um, if any of you have ever gone like apartment hunting online, if you look for apartments, you'll probably notice on Yelp, like most people on, on Yelp about apartments are just there to bitch and complain about stuff. Um, that's really, really powerful and really bad for those places because you can see 20, 30, 40 good reviews of something and then see one bad one and be like, yeah, I'm out. You know, somebody didn't like it. Doesn't matter the 30 or 40 other people liked it. Somebody didn't like it, so, eh, you know, I'm not really feeling it. You know, uh, a Yelp review, I had the worst drink of my life here. I don't actually know where this is from, um, but it was really bad for somebody. This can tank somebody's, like, Yelp profile. One really bad review like this, like one long bad review can just 
savage somebody's Yelp profile, which is why you'll frequently find businesses that actually give a damn will actually like reply to these bad reviews and try to you know, mitigate the damage. You don't see them replying to all the positive reviews like, hey, thanks, glad you, glad you had a great time, because they don't need to. There's nothing, there's nothing that needs to be mitigated or even enforced, reinforced there, because reinforcing it wouldn't do anything. It's already, it's as good as it's going to get, really. Um, but negative stuff, bad info, can, can just brutalize you. So you have to be careful about bad bandwagon. Negative stuff comes across a whole lot better than positive stuff. stuff. All right, authority. Bet you think I'm too, too young for that reference, huh? Yeah, I actually am, but I know who they are. So authority. This one's, this one's funny, um, not just because of chips. Um, authority can really easily trump our own beliefs. Uh, there was a Yale psychologist uh, named Milgram, Stephen Milgram, um, who said, and I will quote this here, uh, humans possess an extreme willingness to go, in almost, to go to almost any lengths on the command of an, of an authority, even if that's against their beliefs. Like, they will go to extraordinary lengths to do what authority tells them to do, even if they think that it's wrong. And he demonstrated this with a really entertaining little experiment. I'm sure it was not entertaining at the time. Um, where a teacher, quote unquote, was instructed to administer electric shocks to students for getting a wrong answer. So people were selected to be students and to answer questions, and there was someone who was supposed to be the teacher. And if the students got the question wrong, they were to be electrically shocked. They were to be actually shocked. And 65% of the teachers obeyed this directive, even though they wanted to stop. They didn't want to keep, you know, frying these people, but they kept doing it anyways. Yeah, it's, it's this, this was in the, in the 60s, back when you could you know, electrically shock strangers at school, and it was OK. I don't think you can get away with it anymore. Um, but they, they, were like, they were electrocuting fellow human beings, and they didn't want to. But they were told to do so by a Yale psychologist, so they did. Most of them did. Two thirds of them did. People have an overwhelming need to conform to some sort of authority. And it doesn't have to be quite as malevolent as Emperor Palpatine. Um, this usually takes the form of things like testimonials. Testimonials are the exact same principle. Hey, I don't know if I should use this particular service, but wait a minute. 37 Signals uses it. I know who 37 Signals is. I like them. 37 Signals said, nothing holds a candle to campaign monitor. Okay, I can conform to that. I can, I can follow along with that kind of authority. Airbnb says campaign monitor delivers the rare. I swear to God, I'm not doing a pitch for campaign monitor. Um, they are pretty good, but I, this is not what this is. Um, Airbnb uses them and likes them. Cameron Mole uses them and likes them. This is the exact same principle of telling someone to shock somebody else. This is, I'm an authority by dint of being a company that you recognize and you respect, and I'm saying you should use this thing. And this is why testimonials come up so often. They seem really cliche or trite, you know, testimonials. It's like, oh, they're everywhere. It's, especially if you do a lot of wireframing for like a marketing site, sometimes you'll just be like, well, I got some extra space here. I could put in some testimonials, right? That'll work. That'll fill some space. Um, it totally does fill space, but it also legitimately works. Like people follow these things. They understand uh, what this what this authority represents, and they they want to kind of conform to that. It's the same sort of thing as this, and this is kind of a, a confluence of like a bandwagon approach and also just authority. Is like you know the most helpful customer reviews. 4,000 people, almost all of 4,000 people, found the following review helpful. That confers authority onto that review. That, can be, that could be nobody. That could be a 13-year-old in the basement who wrote that review. But 4,000 people found it helpful, so they become an authority. They become someone that you trust, someone that you want to follow along with. So it works really, really super well. But you need to be strategic about your placement um, when you're using something like this. Don't just slap these things all over the place. Don't just fall back on authority whenever you possibly can. Um, be strategic about it. Put it where there's barriers, you know? When you actually want to sign up for something, when you're signing up for a service, this is a really, signing up for anything is like a really delicate moment. You probably know this if, you, if you're like a product designer, you have something that people need to sign up for. Signing up conversion is a really delicate moment because you're asking for usually fairly personal stuff from somebody else and you need to provide some sort of clear benefit to warrant them giving you that information. So when you want to create an account, and you want my email address and my first name and my last name and you want me to punch in my password and my password, if you're anything like me, is probably the same password you use for everything. 
um, so I need to kind of trust you, is this is a good time to position yourself as an authority and position the things that actually make this, make this valuable. So in this particular example, you see over in the sidebar that we reiterate benefits. That's not actually really that authoritative. It's coming from you. You may or may not be an authority. In situations like this, you'll very frequently find this is where testimonials live. Is, okay, I have to sign up for this. Do I really want to sign up for this? Well, Cameron Mole says I should sign up for this. So yeah, I guess I'll probably sign up for this. He can't be that wrong, right? Um, so that's typically where you'd find this kind of thing. All right, this one's a little mean, sorry. Um, Faith in aesthetics. This one seems really, I don't know, trite, or it seems kind of, it just seems cheap. It, it, raise your hand if, you, if you're considered like a designer. You a designer in the room? A lot of designers? Okay. How do you feel if somebody says, oh, you're a designer, so you like, you make things pretty, right? You hear, yeah. I heard somebody, I heard somebody go, oh, God, and then do this. <laughs> um, Props. Um, right? You've heard that before, and it's so frustrating. You're just like, no, I don't make things pretty. I make them usable, and I, I make them awesome, and I, da 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 and you, Okay. Andy says beautiful, not pretty. Sorry. Andy makes things beautiful. Um, the funny thing is that actually your ability to make things pretty, and it, I'm sure a lot of you have the ability to make things pretty, actually is valuable. It's not just window dressing. People actually have a lot of faith in things that look good. They have more faith in things that look good than they do things that look bad. There are very few examples of products that were overwhelmingly successful despite the fact that they were just ugly as sin. <laughs> Craigslist being the obvious uh, <laughs> exception to the rule. Um, there's very few that actually manage to get away from that. We first judge sites by their appearance. When you, pull up a, when you pull up a site or you pull up a product, you don't dig right into the content. You don't start reading the testimonials. You don't go straight for those things. You look at it and go, this looks good, or you look at it and go, this looks like ass, I'm out, right? That's just kind of how it works. We judge things by their appearance at first. There was a study done uh, where people were shown health websites, and they said, would you trust this website? Of the people who said, no, I don't trust it, 83% of their negative comments came from the aesthetics of the site. They came from the way it looked. They came from bad visuals. They came from navigation that was hard to read. They came from things that if you're a designer you would maybe consider like, well that's, that's sort of like a trivial thing. Like, yeah, okay, it's not a great image. I had to go to iStock and find something. Cut me some slack. Um, we've all done that. Um, but people actually judge this stuff really, really quickly. And not just like, would I use it or not just would I give it money, but like, do I trust it at all? And if it didn't look good, then in most cases they did not trust it. And that's why, because it didn't look that good. Attractive things just appear to be more valuable. I know we, there was actually food in the back. This would work a little better if you were all really super hungry. But like, I know Burger King is not everybody's cup of tea, including mine. But like, that's a pretty good looking burger, right? Like, that's pretty solid. Like, it's obviously a staged photo, but that's a pretty solid looking burger. That is not, like, that is not a solid looking burger. I mean, if you're really hungry, maybe. Earlier when I was looking at these, I was really hungry. And I was like, actually, I would eat that. <laughs> But generally speaking, you're, this, this looks a lot better. And there's a reason they don't use real product photography when they show you burgers. There's a reason they don't use real product photography when they show you cereal. They're pouring like glue into a bowl full of cereal that has strawberries covered in lipstick on the edge or something. You know, there's a reason they do that. It looks better. It makes it seem more valuable. It makes it seem more like you want to eat it. We attach more value to things that actually look good. And aesthetics actually affect usability. This one can be a hard pill to swallow, especially if you're kind of in the camp of like, well, you should design for the usability and the interactions, and then you should layer on something that looks good because that's just the, the, the cool thing to do, right? Well, the aesthetics actually affect the usability of stuff. When people, OK, this is an instance where the left side of the slide actually has some things that you'd maybe want to read. So I'll just read it for you instead. Oh, you can read it over there. Cool. Hey, that one works. Everybody look over there. Um, <laughs> When people were asked to complete tasks on a phone, uh, it was different kinds of phones. There, there, there's like an iPhone and a Blackberry. Um, it was different kinds of phones. But when they were asked to complete tasks, the devices that were actually more visually appealing, the interface was more visually appealing, the visual appeal of it actually had a motivating effect on the people who were taking it and actually motivated them to complete the tasks faster. They actually solved things more quickly. And it's, it's a difficult like apples to oranges kind of comparison to, to compare like an iOS device to a Blackberry because Blackberries suck. Um, 
Sorry, guys. Um, but it's still like the actual aesthetics had a real effect on the usability of something. It wasn't just, well, this one looks nicer, so I would probably use it anyways. It was you actually did things more quickly. You did them more successfully because it actually looked good and you wanted to use it. The desire for someone to actually use something and want to use something because it looks good and feels good to them is a pretty powerful factor when it comes to their ability to actually complete a task. So you really can't undercut uh, the value of the aesthetics of something. Uh, you can totally get bent out of shape when someone tells you you're a designer, you just make pretty pixels. I get bent out of shape when someone says that to me. That's totally OK. Um, but don't discount the fact that you do make pretty pixels. They actually help things work better. They help people want to use them for them to be pretty pixels. So it's, it's OK. It's not all bad. Achievement. Overcoming challenges makes us feel good, right? Completing something, like overcoming something, that makes us feel good. Competition's great. Competition is great for most people. We have a biological drive to succeed. In some cases, we have a biological drive to succeed in the face of other people. We want to beat them. Um, we like to win. <laughs> Competition's great, but we like to win. Anybody here use Nike Plus? Anybody do Nike Plus? A few people? Nike Plus actually does a few things that are really smart. Um, and one of them is it'll actually take you and all your friends and it'll show you like how far each of you've run in the last, I think it's like month or week or it breaks it down by different things. It, it kind of creates this little like ad hoc competition. And actually I, I tried using Nike Plus a few weeks ago. I say tried because I just, I can't run. Um, but I tried using it and I pulled it up and it was like this, uh, my, a buddy of mine, Lewis, was like three miles ahead of me and I really had this twinge for a minute where I was like, well, shit, I could, go, I could go sweat through three miles and be beating Lewis. That would be, that would be cool. That would make me feel good. It actually, it works. Like, you want to be competitive. You want to win at stuff. I didn't go do three miles. He's beating me still. Um, he did like a half marathon last week. It's just not fair. Um, anyways, we like challenges, but really we like challenges that are sort of challenging. We don't like really difficult challenges. Some people like really difficult challenges. Some people like to really have something put out in front of them. But you don't want that from every product you use. You don't want some sort of insurmountable goal for everything you try to use. It shouldn't feel like climbing Everest to you know, use LinkedIn or something like that. It, it should feel a little easier than that. Um, so we like challenges that are sort of challenging, like Audible. They have you know, different levels or whatever where it's like, App Newbie, I think you get that for listening to like an hour of anything, which is pretty trivial. That's like, well two-thirds of a drive up here from the South Bay in traffic. It's not even all that much. Um, it feels like forever, but it's not that much. Um, and you can achieve this like really quickly. And like App Novice is obviously further up and App Pro is further up. But we like challenges that are like sort of challenging. They're not, they're not crazy hard. And we appreciate rewards a lot more when we don't expect them. So the Audible example is actually not a great example because you expect it. They tell you exactly what it is. It's like, you know, one hour, 100 hours, 500 hours, 1,000 hours. It's like, I know what's coming. I know what's going to happen there. So you can work toward that, but it's not really exciting. It's a lot more exciting when you get rewards that are sort of unexpected. And it's actually science. Unexpected rewards cause greater dopamine levels in your body. When you get an award that you weren't expecting, when you're rewarded with something and you didn't really see it coming, you actually have like a biological reaction to that and it feels good. You're like, ha, ah, yay. I did something and it was cool and you weren't expecting it. Things that you expect aren't, uh, aren't as awesome. Uh, dopamine's not really just about pleasure, it's about the anticipation of pleasure. So it's, boy, that's a weird sentence to say. Um, <laughs> anyways, uh, dopamine's cool. You, everybody likes to have it. You don't maybe realize when you do, but it's, it makes you feel pretty good. Um, and you have more of that when you aren't expecting the reward. So like badges like this became very, very popular. Uh, these are from uh, Treehouse, I believe. Um, badges like this became very popular because it's very easy to make a lot of them and you can't know what they're all for because you're not going to go read through the list of 500 badges and see what they're all for, which means that when they pop up, you're not really expecting them. You didn't really know where they were coming from. So they just sort of pop up and you feel good. You're like, oh, cool, I got a badge. And it means nothing. It's a, 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 a hexagon with a, a glyph inside it and you don't get anything for it. You don't get paid for it. You don't get no one's going to high five you or anything. You're not going to get laid because you got it. Um, but it feels good to get it. And it's just this like arbitrary kind of achievement. And it's fun. We also like showing off. Uh, rewards, are, rewards are cool, but being rewarded you know, entirely in isolation is not quite as cool. You want other people to see your rewards. You know, it's, it's, it's more fun that way. 
And that's why a lot of cases, when you actually do win something, a lot of sites realize that that's a really opportune time for you to, tell, for you to go share that with other people. So if you win an award, you'll frequently see like, hey, you won this award, why not tweet about it? And it's not just because they want you to increase the virality of their blah, 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 although you will be doing that. Um, they realize, and it's, it's true for a lot of people, um, that you want to share that kind of stuff out more than you do other things. People like to kind of show off. So let's talk about the Zeigernick effect. Anybody like this movie? I like this movie. I really like this movie. Um, the Zeigernick effect actually has nothing to do with Joseph Gordon-Levitt walking around this little, this little uh, hallway, which was awesome, by the way. Um, what the Zeigernick effect is, is it's about suspense. When we become engaged in a story, we have to see how it ends. You know, when I, the first time I saw that movie, I really liked that movie. The first time I saw that movie, you know, if the projector had died like two-thirds of the way through, I would have been furious. Like, I would have been very upset. I really wanted to know how that ended. When we are exposed to some sort of story, we're exposed to some sort of path, we really like to know how that ends. We generally like to finish what we start. Most people don't like leaving unfinished business. They don't like leaving unfinished paths or unfinished stories. The key is you have to actually get someone to start something. So the, the canonical example of this that's just like, it's, everyone cites this example, and with good reason, it worked really, really well, is LinkedIn. LinkedIn hit on this years ago. Um, has anybody completed their LinkedIn profile? Like 100%? <laughs> Andy has. You have a couple hands. I'm like 15% away, and it drives me crazy. It drives me crazy. Well, I think, I think what I need is like recommendations from people or something like that, but I'm such a wallflower, I don't want to ask. All right, you, you, hey, there you go. Go recommend me for stuff and complete my LinkedIn profile. That would make me super happy. Um, but LinkedIn, like, LinkedIn nailed this with the, with the Zeigernick effect. They like really understood that people wanted to complete something, but they also realized that to get them to complete something, they have to get you to start something, and that's why you get things like this. Hey, get started. It's free, and it takes less than two minutes. Like, how easy can we possibly make this? Let's lower the bar so low that anyone can get started on this path, because once they get started, they will try to finish it. They may not get all the way there. I've been sitting at 85% for a couple of years, but I, I just don't like asking people for things. Um, so it's awkward for me. Uh, but a lot of people get really, really into that, and they really want to complete that profile. They want to get that little bar the rest of the way. It can be very, very vexing to not be able to actually do that. Something you need to bear in mind when, you're, when you want to use this kind of tactic, when you want to compel people to finish something, is that varying the length of steps uh, keeps us motivated. If it's all the same kind of thing, if you're just sort of slogging through something, it doesn't feel as good. It's not, it's not as easy to get into. It doesn't feel as, it's kind of, the, it's the same effect as unexpected rewards is that you're, you're, something might take a little bit longer, maybe the next one is shorter, and you're like, ooh, cool, okay, I'm done with that work. Um, so it feels pretty good. Even creating like the illusion of progress is useful. Again, LinkedIn is still doing this kind of stuff really, really well, where they just sort of like throw these tiny little steps in front of you. Well, where else have you worked? I was blah at blah. And they show you over here, you know, you got, you got five steps to go. You got one, two, three, four, five, and then you'll see your improved profile. It's pretty smart. You don't know exactly how long those steps are going to be, and that's okay. Uh, but you know that there's a light at the end of the tunnel. There's a clear benefit at the end of it. There's a story that you can finish. There's like, I can finish this one, two, three, four, five. I can do that. I can do five steps. If there were 50 steps here, it's not going to work as well. There's a point at which people no longer want to finish the story. Um, it's it's kind of what happens if you sit down and you try to watch, well, I know at least one person in the audience who would do this, but when you try to watch all of the Lord of the Rings in a row, it's like 12 hours long. See, there she is back there. Um, you, some people will really power through that, and then some people you go, well, it's 12 hours, and they go, yeah, I'm, I'm out. You know? Or they make it halfway, and they're like, I'm so fucking sick of elves. I'm done. Like, I just don't want to do it anymore. So you, there, there's a threshold at which knowing, knowing the number of steps you have to complete to finish a story is a little too much. Um, but something like this works really, really super well. And if all else fails, sometimes a guilt trip works best. Um, so if you want to take somebody on a trip, and the regular kind of trips aren't working, try a guilt trip. Um, like, uh, like these guys do, like Nike does. Uh, hey, you know, you had a goal for September 13th, it was to get 3,000, you know, fuel points, and you missed it. You got to here. You didn't get to here. Um, you should feel bad. Yeah. 
you didn't, you didn't do as well as you should have. You should feel bad. It actually works super well. They're not dicks about it, which is probably helpful. I mean, if, if somebody just popped up and made fun of you for it, um, it's not going to be as successful. But just saying, hey, you missed your goal. You'll hit it next time. You just feel like, oh, God, now I have to hit it next time. Like, Nike believes in me. They think I'm going to hit it next time. I guess I better do that. Uh, so it, it, it works, you know. Like, a, a little bit of a guilt trip uh, with, with your users is okay. Don't make them feel terrible about themselves. But a little bit of a guilt trip is okay. That can be really, really effective. So the Zeigernick effect is just, it's a, it's a fancy word uh, named after a guy. Um, but it basically just means people want to finish what they start. If you start a goal, you want to hit that goal. If you start up a path, you want to get to the end of the path. If you start a story, you want to get to the end of the story. You can use that uh, when you want people to complete something, you want them to do something, is set it up as a path they need to reach the end of. It works really, really well. So let's talk about self-expression. That's a, that's a shot. Um, self-expression. We are unique, special snowflakes, right? I'm a unique, special snowflake. Everybody else here is a unique, special snowflake? Yes. Got some hands? Yeah. High self-esteem. Um, we are unique, special people, and we want to show other people how unique and special we are. Some of the ways we do that are things that we create or that we own. And we perceive the things that we own or that we create as more valuable than other things. Something that I just go to the store and buy, I may be attached to. Like, I may be reasonably attached to it. Because I own it. Like, it's, it's my thing. Like, this is my phone. I didn't create this, obviously, but I bought it. And it's my phone, and I'm very fond of it. And it's going away in a couple of weeks, but don't tell it that. Um, but it's, it's, it's very, I'm very, very fond of it. But I didn't make it. Like, things that I made, like, there's, I have these, like, crappy bowls at home that I, like, painted back when it was cool to go paint pottery. They're terrible, and I would never eat out of them or anything. But I still have them. I haven't thrown them away. Um, they are valuable to me because I made them. They're junk, but I made them. Things that we actually make we perceive as being significantly more valuable than the things that somebody else has or that we didn't create or that we just sort of picked up or we bought or were given to us. That well, actually, giving to us is not the same because that has an emotional attachment. Um, that is a real picture of me, by the way. I didn't get the mug. I maybe should. Um, <laughs> but things that we create are more valuable to us. So find ways to make an experience feel personalized. Find ways to make an experience feel like something that they own. There's actually uh, there's sort of an ongoing debate about when you create a user interface, do you say my stuff or your stuff? Have you ever seen that? Um, this is actually, the funny thing is actually there's really not quite a right answer for that. Um, but you can, you can sort of imagine like, is it my profile when I pull something up or is it your profile? Is the site talking to me? In both cases though, it's clearly my thing. Whether the site says that it's your profile, it's still my profile. If it's, it's still my picture, it's still my avatar, it's still my whatever, my page, my this, my that. They may say my or your, but it's always mine. Um, and that's because people want you to feel like you own something. They want you to feel like it belongs to you because you value that a lot more. Uh, some like car manufacturers get this. Like Scion has always been really good about like having this like incredible configuration kind of stuff. Like you can do all kinds of just ridiculous shit to these little, these little lunch boxes. Um, and it's because they understand that it may not, I actually, I swear to you, I don't actually know much about Scions. I don't know if they're good cars or not. But they could be terrible cars, but if you did, like, every little facet of it, you picked out exactly the seats you wanted and the color you wanted and what kind of stereo you wanted and, like, where the, you know, where this was and that was, that's going to be more valuable to you than something you just drove and saw on the lot and, and drove off with. It's going to be more valuable to you because it's, it's yours. You, you created it to some extent. You didn't really create it. You didn't make a car. But you kind of created it, and that becomes more valuable to you. So that really, really works. You do need to keep personalization options small. Just like with anything else, too much of a good thing is, is, is too much for people to handle. You need to keep it, you need to keep it reasonably minimal. Uh, a really good example of personalization that's never too overwhelming, it can be a little overwhelming, but never too overwhelming, is uh, Netflix. Netflix does a pretty good job of this. They put a few options in front of you at a time. This is about as many as they'll put in front of you at once, which is like, Eight different, eight different things that I can go in and rate. And even that's like a little, it's bordering on a little too much, but it's not bad. But a lot of times if you pull up Netflix, they'll just show you one thing and say, did you see this? And if you did, how much did you like it? That's easy, and it personalizes the experience to me so that every time I go to Netflix, I know that it is at least reasonably tailored to me or whoever else was using my account, which is sometimes the case. Um, which is why I have things on there like the Lorax. 
um, or Mickey Mouse Clubhouse Road Rally. I swear I don't know why Netflix is recommending that to me. Um, <laughs> the rest of it's, well, questionable. The Avengers is great, I like that. Um, but personalization is really, really powerful and Netflix has always been really good about uh, affording the ability to personalize stuff because it becomes your experience, it's your product. I would never go to Netflix and like try to use a signed out experience because I wouldn't trust that it's putting the stuff I like in front of me or that it's gonna show me the right stuff. I want my experience, I want my Netflix. I don't want somebody else's. So keep in mind personalization, you can totally go overboard and personalization is not a silver bullet either. You can't just let people customize like the color of the header and expect them to just drool all over your product. It's not, it's not gonna work quite like that. There's certainly services that did that. They're like, hey, you can change the color of all of the links on our website to whatever you want uh, and expect people to just be like, yay, I'm never gonna leave. Um, they will, they don't care about that kind of thing. You need to give them the right personalization and you need to give them just the right amount of it, but it is really powerful to have your own experience. <laughs> all right, surprise and delight. This is, this is kind of a big one and it's, it's it's not trivial, it, it seems small, but it can be a really, really big thing, which is that we remember key moments in our experiences. We remember the highs and the lows. We don't remember really the stuff in between. Things that are just okay, they just kind of fade, they just go away. But we remember the really high moments and we remember the really low moments. So what you can do to actually work from that is create highs, create really fun, delightful, surprising little moments that people are going to remember are going to make them want to use whatever it is you're offering. Flickr, however you feel about their recent redesign and other sort of shenanigans that they're doing, um, always had kind of this fun little thing where every time you logged in, it would say hello to you in a different language. And it would say, hey, now you know how to say hello to people in Finnish, which you don't here because I don't have any idea how to pronounce that. <laughs> um, I went to Finland not that long ago. Their language is crazy. I don't even know where to begin. There's like umlauts and accents on everything. Um, but most of the time, it's something you can pronounce, and it's like, hey, that's fun. Like, if I think of Flickr, I think of, okay, it's a photo site, but I also think every time you go there, they say hello to you in a different language, and it's trivial, and it's not that hard to hook up engineering-wise, and it's just kind of a little thing. But it's a high that people remember, and they kind of like it for that. So whatever Flickr's other flaws might be, you'll always kind of remember it for that and like it for that. Things like this, like clever copy. You know, if you're gonna have a testimonial, hey, we didn't even make this up, this is like a real thing. People remember like fun, kind of engaging copy, things that are just, you know, you, you read it and it feels like a human being and you're like, it, it just makes you feel good. And you remember that they had this kind of fun tone and this good copy and that will gloss over all manner of flaws uh, in, their, in, your, in their eyes. Uh, you can get away with a lot by having some, some nice moments like this. Or you know, things like this, like Woot. When you open up your cart and it's empty, your cart is empty. Oh, you're just pushing around an empty cart. Fill that thing up, like some sort of little monkey telling you what to do. You remember these kinds of little moments and they're very easy to do and they're very, very small. But it works really well. Easter eggs, if you go to uh, the Vogue website and punch in the Konami code, raptors and hats will scream across the bottom of the screen just over and over and over again. And I feel really good about that because Zurb actually made the plugin that does that. It's called Raptorize. Um, but it's, it's, so, it's so out of character for Vogue. But they, got like a, they had like an article on NextWeb or TechCrunch or something because of this. It was like, did you know if you go to Vogue's family of websites and punch in the Konami code, Raptors scream across the screen? Like, it's just a fun little moment. It's, it's not anything that anyone's ever going to, hardly anyone's ever going to see. Um, but it keeps things fun for a few people. It's a delightful, it's a surprising little moment that they like. In addition to creating highs, you also need to validate lows. Not everything's going to be great. Not everything's going to be rosy for all of your users. So you need to validate when there's like a, a low moment. Like, hey, email this to your friends. If there's an error message, you didn't enter any email addresses. We're smart, but we're not psychic. Like, you can be a little cheeky about things. You can have a little fun with some of this stuff. People are very used to seeing error messages. You try to submit a form, and if you see a red box at the top, you just go, oh, damn it, I didn't punch in something right and now everything's probably wiped out and I have to punch in my credit card again and it's probably telling me my password doesn't have the right number of special characters and umlauts and accents and what have you. It's frustrating, but if you can make it a little bit more fun, you can, you can cushion the blow. Um, it's a surprising, delightful little moment that people appreciate. 404 pages are great for this. Um, people are going to break your website, your product, whatever. They're gonna have problems, they're gonna hit pages that don't exist anymore, you know? 
do something fun with it. Like there's, there's thousands of examples of good 404 pages, but ah, you found me. Um, unfortunately, that means you also found a 404 page, which means what you're looking for is no longer here. But I won't be thinking like, oh crap, I broke the site. I'll be thinking, ha, that's funny. Ish. It's not hilarious, but it's funny. Um, so you can cushion the blow. You can kind of like make the lows a little easier to deal with. Surprising people, delighting people, whether it's a high or a low, it's going to work really well for you because the highs and the lows are what people actually remember. They don't remember everything in between. Everything in between is just getting stuff done. The highs and the lows are what really make something for you. So that was a lot of different things you can do to people. That was a lot of knobs. Yeah, you can like move these things around and kind of, kind of manipulate people and tweak them a little bit. Um, knowing which ones to actually use is really, really valuable. And the way to actually learn that is to, is to play with them. There's a lot of different things you can do to m manipulate people, essentially, into doing what you want them to do, or really even better, manipulate them into doing what they want to do. I, I really did mean it when I, I say, you shouldn't manipulate people in any kind of sinister way. I, I feel slightly bad to, to say that you should manipulate. This is not to say that I wouldn't do it, um, just that maybe you shouldn't. But you are actually, when you manipulate people in the right way, when you actually have them kind of go down a path that you want them to go down, if you really believe in the thing that you're building, if you believe in your product, if you believe in your service, you're not doing them a disservice. You're not duping them. You're just helping them do the thing that's going to be the best for them anyways. So that's OK. Like you, you should be able to manipulate people a little bit. So just to recap, as one does, um, familiarity bias, you know, show them something they already understand. That really, really helps. Relative value, give them things to compare. Comparison is much easier for people than just independently evaluating something. It's easier to compare one thing to another. Bandwagon, you know, tell them that they're missing out. Tell them what they're missing out on. Tell them who all says they're missing out on it. Like, make them understand that it's not just you saying this. It's, excuse me, it's lots of people. Authority, say that it's worth their while. Have authority, position authority. Use authority to your benefit so that people feel like they're making a good decision because it's validated by other good decisions. Make it attractive. Faith in aesthetics, make it attractive. Don't get too caught up in people calling you a pretty pixel pusher or anything like that, but do make things look good because it actually has meaningful value to make things look good. And make it fun, you know, have, have some sort of achievement. Make it a fun game. Help them get closure. Zygernik Effect is about getting closure. Help them finish the story. Help them complete their path. Let them feel unique, like her. Um, Help them, help them feel like the, the special, you know, unique snowflake that they are, and they will appreciate it. And finally, just entertain them. You know, they, they will love the highs and the lows of whatever it is you do. Entertain them with something that, that sticks. Entertain them with something that they're going to remember. So, nine ways, nine ways to manipulate people. Uh, we use them a lot at Zerve. I've used them a lot. I know lots of other people use them. There's thousands of examples of using these exact kind of, uh, these exact kind of methods. They really, really do work. They will help you uh, quite a bit. So thank you very much. I appreciate you guys all coming out here. Um, if you want a recap of all this stuff, you can actually go to zerb.com slash nine ways. It actually has all nine of them in a nice little format that you can click on and read about just a little, a little recap thing. Um, I know I already said thanks, but I, I did actually want to say thank you to Andy for having me. Um, it's always fun to come and talk at these things. And thank you StubHub for hosting us. This is a very cool space, um, even if it's not technically on the street that it says it's on. So anyways. Um, <laughs> so. Uh,